Hi friends, welcome back to another new day on the Bible Project Daily Podcast. It's great that you're with me here today. Thanks for joining me. Today we're going to look at this lovely story where Jesus is seen to raise the son of a widow. The, pa the passage we're going to share today is a powerful and a touching story where Jesus will be seen to raise the woman, the child rather, of a widow, raise them from the dead. It's a narrative, a beautiful narrative filled with compassion, miracles and deep spiritual truths. So welcome to the Bible Project Daily Broadcast. I'm so glad you're here with me today. If you're here for the first time, then why not click on the subscribe button and make the in-depth study of the Word of God part of the rhythm of your daily life from hence forward. So thanks for being here. Do hang on at the end where I'll tell you how this all works. And we'll just pick up where we left off last time in the narrative in Luke chapter 7. Bye-bye for now. In the first century, when Jesus walked on this earth, he said this thing to people. He told people, he said to them, follow me. And when he said that, it actually meant that literally. They would absolutely, literally leave their homes, sometimes even leave their businesses, and walk around the ancient area, the Roman area of Palestine, what we today call Israel, and they would go with the Lord from city to city, following him, watching him, listening to him, learning from him as he conducted his ministry of preaching, teaching, and of doing stuff as well. Now, I'm going to ask you to take, have a little imagination, but I want to imagine that you're in a crowd of people who were following Jesus in that day. You've decided you're going to follow him, and I would point out that there were women as well as men following Jesus. It wasn't just the 12 apostles. There were crowds of people who also followed, listening and learning and watching what was going on, following him from one place to the other. Now, there would have been many times when Jesus would have perhaps surprised you, surprised you with the depth of his teaching and the revelations that he brought. He brought. If you were thinking about it later, you might recall high points, like his hugely significant teachings that he gave in what was called the Sermon on the Mount. We've just worked through that together for the second time. Or later, we will find a, an amazing section where he will teach at length on a place called the Mount of Olives, talking about the end times and the future to come. But what follows today is not a great set of teaching like that. It's just a description of something that happens, something that Jesus did. Something that Jesus did, so although it's just a narrative, if you like, it is also one of the most touching stories in all of the Gospels, but it is also a story full of meaning, loaded with spiritual truths. So let's share that story tonight, and I'll do what I'll always do, which is read first, uh, the whole passage, which is Luke 11, sorry, Luke 7, verses 11 to 17, and then we'll work through it verse by verse quickly, and then I'll try and draw it all together and see what I believe I think it means. In my Bible, this passage is called Jesus Raises a Widow's Son. It says, Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd came out from the town with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up to her and touched the bear that they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praise. A great prophet has appeared amongst us, they said. God has come to help his people. 
This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Now, this story is incredibly straightforward. It starts just by describing for us a mother who's had a tragic day, perhaps the most tragic day of her life, in that she has just lost her son. But it, but then she is leaving the town in the funeral processions and she has this encounter with the Lord. And the amazing thing he does is described here. But let's begin by just revisiting the text and begin, first of all, by looking for a moment at the mother. It starts by telling us that these events take place after Jesus had just healed the centurion's servant. Now, to understand the context, it's important to know that often professional mourners were hired for just occasions, creating a, a, a spectacle of which many, many people would witness. So these mourners and the supporting crowd are following the casket, carried on what was called a bier at that time. And but So there's this large crowd heading out from the center of the city, I would imagine, to the area where the bodies were buried, which was usually outside the city walls. And then Jesus is coming with his disciples and his additional followers and hangers on and these two crowds they're converging together on this narrow perhaps narrow road that is uh, as as they're leaving and and Jesus and his followers are entering the cities so it's inevitable that they're going to see each other and encounter encounter each other but verse 12 is describing it for us as a somber scene because it's telling us a dead man has been carried out now, this would have been significant on its own, but Luke adds a couple of details, poignant details, that intensify the sorrow around this particular event, this particular death. The deceased is described with the additional information that he is the woman's only son. Now, that is important. Now, for any parent, the loss of a child is probably unimaginable, really. But adding to the tragedy here in this time in this culture is the fact that this is the only son of this woman. He is the one, the only one who could carry on the family name. To compound the seriousness and to compound the grief of this narrative, it also reveals that this woman is a widow. Now that was a circumstance that meant at that time in the first century meant absolute vulnerability for her her potential destitution, in fact. Without a male relative to care for her, protect for her, provide for her, she faced a very precarious future. These details are not added by accident and they're not incidental. Luke intends us, as his readers, to grasp the depth of the tragedy that has occurred here. The death of a child is a profoundly unnatural and challenging thing at the best of times for any parent to bear. And we can note that such deaths are especially cruel, I suppose because they really are not the natural order of things as we imagine them. They cut short a life full of beauty and potential and the hope of that parent in the future. Children are meant to bring joy happiness, laughter into our lives. They hold a unique place in our relationships in our life. Being born from the very essence of a couple coming together, and some have said that when a child dies, a part of a parent is buried with them. And I understand that context and the profound grief that must be associated with an event like this. I'm just reminded, I once chatted with a man in his 70s and within a few minutes of meeting him and of spending some time together he shared a photograph of a child a child that he'd lost over 50 years ago it reflects for me the reality that for some people life well for them they're living in a world of great loss and unfulfilled potential you never know the backstory of people when you meet them the world for some is filled with sorrows and on this particular day this is such a situation. This lady is a, must have had a profoundly broken heart and it is this narrative that Luke is drawing into focus for us here. Verse 12 notes for us the crowd accompanying her. However the narrative shifts from the mother 
to the Lord himself in the next verse. And it states that when the Lord saw her and when they passed each other, he was moved with compassion and he said, do not weep. Now the term compassion in Greek implies a sense of feeling of pity. Well, better word would be empathy. It originates from a noun that actually refers to the inner parts, those things like a heart, liver, lungs, even the bowels. So this is talking about the real seat of our emotions, the seat of our feelings, the source of all our feelings are set, uh, 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 themselves. In the sense, compassion should always, true compassion should always involve a truly deep and emotional empathetic response jesus despite the philosophical ideas of that time that were held high by many he stood head against face against the stoic beliefs that god that the god the creator of the universe was apathetic incapable of feeling the stoics were the influential greek culture group at that time the philosophical group uh, books like writings like the Enchiridion uh, were a manual for a way of of living and existing without allowing motion to be. They, in fact, the Stoics argued that if someone could influence another's emotions, then they were greater than the person. So they taught a way of holding your emotions so that nothing affected you and no one could have power over you. Therefore. In their thinking, also, since no one or no thing could be greater than God himself, they concluded that God must be incapable of feeling any emotion. However, Jesus here, he demonstrates a different view of God. As God's son, he shows compassion, empathy, showing that indeed God can be moved and can even be moved by the broken heart of a mother, the everyday suffering of an ordinary person. The text explicitly says that Jesus has compassion on her and he comforts the grieving mother, initially by telling her not to weep. So this story head on challenges the prevailing Stoic Greek philosophical perspective and at the same time highlights the depths of God's, the depth of God's emotional engagement in human suffering. If we isolate the, stem, the statement of him saying, do not cry, it can initially seem a little bit insensitive, possibly coming across as a lack of empathy. Imagine saying someone, someone saying something to, like that to you at a time of distress. However, here, the phrase do not weep is just an opener. In verse 13, it serves as an introduction to what Jesus is now going to do immediately in the following verse. This isn't a callous or an insensitive remark. Instead, this is a, a, a remark that lays the groundwork, if you like, for the miracle of hope that Jesus is about to perform in front of this dear woman, this mother. Now, for us, a little lesson here is worth taking on board. It's crucial to remember the difference between sympathy and empathy. Jesus says, I'm sorry, which is compassionate, but he's also saying, he's also signaling he's going to do something about it. And we too, in our compassion, should be saying more than we're just sorry for your loss or sorry for your situation. We should, in a sense, be asking, let me help in this type of situation or in any when people have a need. So when Jesus tells this grieving mother here not to weep, this is definitely not one of those casual comments that people throw out at times of loss. This is the opening gambit of a message of hope. And I think we need to understand today it's essential for us to be mindful and cautious in similar situations. We have to have a genuine compassion and be careful not to inadvertently say the wrong thing. The wrong thing. Insensitive mar uh, remarks hurt and remember and hang around in people's mind for a long time, even sometimes if they're well-intentioned. 
People often offer cliches that they say things like, well, maybe it was in God's plan or the old one, there's a reason for everything, thinking what they're doing is comforting that person. Yeah, I believe that those sort of cliched phrases just come across as insensitive at that time just can come across as something that actually distances people from the Lord and how he feels about this situation. But Jesus here, by his words, is about to turn the woman's tears into the testimony of a miracle performs. And he addresses her with words of hope, and then he reassures her by saying, look, something miraculous is going to happen. And then we see in verse 14, Jesus approaches the, which would have been at that time, an open coffin, a, a box-like structure carried on a, a slated carrying beer, as it was called, which allowed everyone to openly see the body there, carried in a way that is still how funerals are conducted in some parts of the Middle East today. And then the other thing to notice here is the fact that despite the enormous cultural and religious ta taboo of being around, let alone touching a dead body, Jesus reaches out and touches the coffin. And then, well, it appears to me in almost a straightforward manner, he speaks to this deceased young man and simply tells him to arise. And amazingly, that's exactly what this young guy does. He sits up and it tells us he starts speaking. So this act of Jesus not only defies all the cultural and religious norms of the time, but it also in an instant transforms a moment of grief into a miraculous testimony, not just for the crowd following Jesus, but the whole funeral procession and bringing immediate comfort to the woman, the widow woman herself. Imagine being a pallbearer in that day, or just a mourner, witnessing this deceased person suddenly standing up and talking again. This is an extraordinary scenario. Now, it might explain the reaction in verse 16, where it says the crowd that fear came upon the, all of them. However, before just thinking about verse 16, consider the tail end of verse 16, where it says this. Notice this, you can almost let pass it by. It says he gives her back to his mother. He presents the, her, him back to her, as it says in some translations. This act carries a hugely significant meaning. In many instances, when we see Jesus perform a miraculous healing or even a resurrection, we are told that the person gets up and follows them. Yet in this place, he presents the resurrected young man back to his mother. The small but powerful detail underscores the compassion and the comfort that first moved Jesus to act, that of the need of the mother. Instead of urging the young man to instantly become a follower of him, Jesus recognizes the primary need for the immediate need for a family reunion. The grieving mother ultimately needed her son back more than anything else. And this simple yet profound act where Jesus reunites the mother and the son brings instant comfort to this situation. Can you imagine the overwhelming joy that that, that, uh, that, that would have brought into a woman who at that point heart would have been deep, deep in sorrow and grief? The Lord in his compassion offers comfort, not just by pra the physical, practical thing of raising him from the dead, but by restoring the mother's relationship with her son. The whole family and their future is restored and revitalized. Now, this observation resonates with the broader themes throughout the Bible, particularly in the passages we see in the New Testament where we uh, c Christians are comforted uh, by hope, by the hope that we can find in the face of death. Passages that resonate even today in funeral services up and down this land. For example, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, Paul writes to comfort believers who themselves have lost their loved ones. And the hope he chooses to present them with is one which is centered on the promise of a future resurrection and reunion of all believers with those who have passed away in Christ. The reunion describes is described in a way as us all being caught up together in the clouds to meet, 
to be together again to serve the Lord. It's the ultimate source of comfort for any grieving Christians. So when you are seeking to comfort someone who is grieving, I think it's essential clearly to choose our worlds carefully, wait for the right moment. But this passage from Luke and these other examples from the broader New Testament context reveal that the comfort that God ultimately offers for believers centers in the promise of a reunion, a reunion together in the future. Uh, uh, which enables us to latch on to that as the main theme when it comes to us trying to help others and comfort those who are facing loss in these days. When God comforts us today, but it's interesting also to note that when God comforts us today, we shouldn't necessarily assume he's going to make everything that is wrong in our lives immediately right. He doesn't necessarily fix everything in the moment. He comforts us ultimately with the deeper, the more pro profound promise that in the end, everything is going to be okay. okay. In the end, all wrongs will be righted. He doesn't also comfort us when we acknowledge ourselves as sinners. By overlooking that sin, he comforts us that we are forgiven by forgiving our sins. He doesn't comfort us also many times by taking away the physical pain or the troubles we may have to be endure or be under. He usually comforts us by giving us the strength to bear them and to learn something through them. So he's met this lady coming out with her dead son in the funeral procession and he has compassion on her and that compassion moves him to give her the great comfort of not only bringing her son back but by handing him back to her. Now in verse 16 it mentions that the fear comes across the crowd. Now if we put ourselves in their shoes well I think it's likely that we might react have reacted in a similar way. However, very quickly we see at the close of the passage that this fear, based on this uh, awe, if you like, of what they've just seen, uh, the, that sort of very quickly transforms into a recognition of what's really happened here and they begin to praise God. The crowd acknowledges that God has performed a miracle and in response they very quickly go from fear to glorifying him. They even go on to, now some of them just go on to proclaim that he's a great prophet who's risen amongst them and that God has visited his people this day, which uh, of course they rightly see that this is a miracle and they're attributing it to God, fair enough. But clearly still at this stage, early in his ministry, uh, it's very clear that a great many of the people do not yet fully grasp what Jesus' identity is. They're seeing him as a prophet and they're simply drawing the parallel to the Old Testament story of Elijah raising from one from the dead. Awestruck by that and praising God for it, but not fully recognizing what's really going on here. Now, this recognition, while accurate to a degree, of course, falls short of a complete understanding of the absolute full magnitude of who is standing in front of them, who Jesus really is. He is not just a prophet. He's more than that. He's the Messiah. He's the shepherd of his people. He's the savior of the people. He's the priest and the coming king for that nation of Israel. Now, despite their partial understanding, and even though it's only limited, still the miraculousness of this event uh, spreads throughout the whole region, reaching even, we are told, the Pharisees, the priests, and the scribes in Jerusalem. The story that this lovely little story highlights for us, primarily the compassion of Jesus for a widow, and how it, it, it's transformed into action where he raises this woman's son from the dead. But this simple yet profound narrative story underscores a wider, broader theme in Jesus' ministry and the fact of his giving his life. Whether he is healing the blind, the, deem, the deaf, helping the lame walk again, or even raising the dead, all these miracles are meant to serve as spiritual illustrations. They, in, in, they symbolize and, and bring to light 
who Jesus really is, and in this case, how he brings life, or it can be sight, or hearing, or simply the ability to walk with God to those people who were previously spiritually blind, deaf, paralyzed, or even in this case, dead, spiritually dead. He can have victory over all these situations. So, in summary and conclusions, the essence of this story lies in the fact that Jesus is giving his life and doing these things in the interim as a way of demonstrating his compassion for men and women on this earth. And as followers of Christ, we are, of course, called to copy this compassion and empathy in how we relate to other people. Thereby, we are recognizing that he gave his life in the fullest sense. And we, in, in, in terms of being thankful for that, should be doing likewise. Now, at a funeral, at an event like this, the comparison may seem self-evident, but often those spiritual parallels are not so apparent and easy to spot in everyday situations. But the point I want to emphasize uh, as I conclude today is that the source of Jesus' compassion in the story, the thing that moved him, was the empathy he felt for the other person. The story, the source of Jesus' compassion in this story is the empathy he felt, the visible pain he felt of this grieving mother, a woman who had not only lost her son, but lost her whole role in society as a mother and as a family. The key lesson here is that Jesus was moved by compassion. He was moved by the empathetic way in which he understood and felt the pain of the situation, the woman in front of him. The world out there, friends, is full of broken hearts. And it's essential for us to recognize that virtually everyone we encounter will have had an experience of hurt, maybe profound heartbreak at some point in their lives. Now, people often will wear facades. They'll not really present the true selves to you. But deep, deep down, I believe for most people, there is a profound hidden pain. Nearly everyone, by the time they have become a mature adult, have had their heart broken at some time or had some tragedy in their life. And as you get older, that is more and more likely. Therefore, I believe it's crucial to understand that behind the exterior of whatever is presenting itself, whatever is standing before us, not, no matter how cold and how run receptive to the gospel, there often lies the story of a broken heart. So we need, the key takeaway I think today, is we need to be attuned to the fact that people around us, regardless of appearances, may be carrying great burdens. And our compassion for them, our empathy for them, needs to be stirred no matter what we see on the surface by understanding that the pain that they might experience may be silent or may be even not fully recognized by them. Rejection of the Lord is often not as logical as some pretend it really is often it's more likely to be emotional. A famous psych psychologist wrote about the fact and demonstrated through his research that most decision-making in life is not logical, it is in fact emotional. And that's what I would like to say to you. Most people's rejection of the gospel, they may wrap it up in all this logical argument, creation versus evolution, some other thing like that, or science, and they'll disguise it all. But underneath neath the reality of the rejection of Jesus Christ in the gospel is probably emotional. It's probably because of the loss of a family member, a friend, a death in their life, or a tragic situation where they look and think, how could God do that? So my suggestion to you is that if you want to be more like Jesus, then you need to be a more compassionate person. You should be able to look into the heart of people and see the need, yes, and even the hurt in their lives. 
And when you find it, then it's a whole lot easier for you to have a Christ-like attitude towards them. And one other observation. If you think back to the opening of this passage today in verse 11, it says that there was a large crowd. Now this was a crowd made up not just of the women coming out of the city, there's also those disciples and followers coming into the city with Jesus. And Luke divides these people into two groups. There are those that are learning and following and those that are just looking on. And I suppose what I'd like to draw to a close today is by asking the question, which group do you belong to? Are you the ones who look at Jesus, look what he did, look what he said at what he said here and just think, oh, this is a nice story? Or are you prepared to be the one who looks and learns? Are you learning from what Jesus said? Are you learning from what we're learning together as you and I study the Bible together? As believers in Jesus Christ, we belong in one crowd or the other. And perhaps we need to move away from being just in the looking crowd and lean more towards being in the learning crowd. And the takeaway today is to learn to be more like Jesus, to look at compassion, to see the real people and just like him, try and meet them at their point of need. I do hope you found that a helpful passage. Okay, friends, that's it for today. We leave it there. Can I remind you that this podcast is available all over the network? You can subscribe to it wherever you get your podcasts from. It's also available in video format on YouTube and all those places. Why not click on the subscribe or the notification button? That way you won't need, you need not miss another single episode. That way you can make this time together that you and I are having studying the Word of God part of the rhythm of your daily life. It's about spending time every day in the Word. I post new episodes pretty much every day, Monday to Friday, with occasional bonus episodes at the weekend. It, you can, and you can follow it wherever you get your podcasts from. And you can do it at whatever pace works for you. If you're just new to this, why not consider going back to episode one and join us on this whole journey? A journey I believe that will take. I'm planning for it to be about 10 years. I hope the Lord plans to keep me around to enable me to do that. But why not join, make that decision and do that and follow along at what works for you? You will find that it's hosted on the Bible Project at buzzsprout.com. You may see all the links where you're getting your podcasts from, but if you're not seeing links to the other places we exist online, then have a look at the, at the host page on Buzzsprout, the Bible Project at buzzsprout.com, because there you'll find links where you can click through to the social networks, the LinkedIn page, even the YouTube channel where I'm creating the long-term archive for all this material and because I'm able to put it in playlist format there. So as it expands, you can go and say, right, I want to go and have a look at Mark. I want to go and have a look at Exodus, whatever it is you'll be able to find. And also later on, I'll be able to allocate it to multiple playlists where I'll, I'll be able to put it into themes as well. And I think that'll be a, a useful resource for people. The plan is for this teaching always to be free, always to be freely available and always copyright free. And that's because there is a place where you can, if you want, support this ministry and partner with it. You can even reach out to me on places like Patreon. Uh, it is those contributions that enable this teaching to be offered free in all these platforms around the world. So if you feel that God's calling you to support in that way, you can do that there. But the important thing is, the main thing is that you've just made the decision to, to choose to study the Word of God every day. That's the thing that's going to transform your life. That's the thing whereby God, by His Holy Spirit, will be able to speak to you and help you live a life that is not only honouring to God, but is more like Jesus Christ Himself. So thanks for joining me, and I do trust I'll see you back here again tomorrow on the Bible Project Daily Podcast. Bye-bye for now.